You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by Myax, one of the fastest, most efficient trading platforms in the world. Myax is proud to bring you Spikes Volatility Products. Spikes options and futures are traded on the Spikes Volatility Index, Spike, offering pinpoint accuracy, radically faster dissemination, and a highly transparent settlement auction, all for ultra-low exchange fees. It's volatility reimagined. Learn more about spikes at myaxoptions.com slash spikes. Options and futures involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. The statements made are provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied on for financial or legal advice. And now, it's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. All right, everybody, that music means it is time once again to commence our journey to the volatility dark side. Yes, it is time for Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. My name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting network upon which so many of you are mainlining these days. Of course, you want to go above and beyond. You want to get extra shows just like Options Oddities coming up a little bit later today. You want to get our pro Q&A. Had another great one with the once future and indeed present Dr. Vix. He had some interesting thoughts on a lot of different things on the levels of vol, on whether this sell-off has some legs on crypto, on whether all this retail, this super hyped retail explosion we've seen in the option space, whether that's really a thing or there's other stuff going on. Check that one out if you haven't already the options insider.com slash pro is the place to go to hear that and everything else we do of course also register for the giveaways that we do all the time just did one this week for yet another pro trading crate so as fast as i'm getting stuff in here to the studio we're sending it out <laughs> to you guys there it's just non-stop sending away of all sorts of great goodies the options insider.com slash pro is the place to go to get access to all those giveaways and a whole bunch more. Of course, the cool kids can go to slash secret club. Don't tell anybody about that. That's a secret. It's just between me and you. <laughs> and hopefully these guys didn't hear it because I am joined by two folks to help me hold down these crazy vol markets. First, we go out to the southern volatility mecca known as Austin, where we are joined once again by the greasiest of meatballs, Mr. Mark Sebastian. From OptionPit.com, Mr. Meatball, welcome back to Volatility View, sir. Hey, good to be here. I'm excited to uh, to talk about all things vol and be all over everything going on in this market. And there are a few things going on to sink our teeth into. And also joining us to help us parse all this madness, holding down the MyAx hot seat this week, Mr. Matt McFarlane, the derivatives, products, and biz dev specialist over there for futures. At my axe. Mr. Matt, welcome back to Volatility View, sir. It has been too long. Yeah. Hi, Mark. Uh, great to be back. Yeah, it has been a while. I, I think it was late April was the last time on your show. So 
Lots to talk about about ball today, so looking forward and to I it. And I can confirm, since your last appearance in April, Matt, that I have met you in person. You did come to Chicago, so Matt does exist. I have proof of life. He's not just a voice on the other end of, of the show here. He does exist in person, so good stuff to be had there as we keep on rolling right on into the Volatility Review. It's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world. It's time for the Volatility Review. All right, everybody, welcome to the Volatility Review, the portion of the show where we break down what the heck is trading and trending out there from a volatility perspective. And coming into the start of the show, we are seeing the broad markets Trending back towards the red, S&P off over one, about 1.1%. The Dow off about half percent and the NASDAQ off right around 2%. Does seem like we are rebounding a little bit off the lows. Looks like the S&P hit about 4,100 and then has rallied almost 30 handles since then. Will that persist? Will be another day where we closed unched or maybe green? (laughs) Or will we just a little bit of a dead cat bounce for the weekend then right back down again? We shall see as the show unfolds here going out to the land of volatility spikes coming into showtime right around 25 and a half that puts it down about three quarters of a point from where it was this time last week vix cash right around 25 and a quarter that puts it down about half a point from where it was this time last week vvix again we kind of touched on it last week it is still down there listeners 92 and three quarters down a full point from where it was this time last week in fact our question of the week has to do with that. We will get into the results of that a little bit later on in the show. But right now, we're asking you guys, Vol, Vol itself, a.k.a. VVIX. You can also go with V Spikes out there. Back below 100 for the first time in over a year. Is this the start of a new volatility regime for the market or just the calm? Before the next volatility storm gave you three choices, this is the start of a new vol regime. This is the calm before the storm or Vol of Vol is just confusing. <laughs> You would throw your hands up and say, I, I don't I don't get this stuff. That's certainly a, a viable option in these markets. I understand if you're a little bit confused out there. So get over there to add options if you haven't done so already. We'll reveal the results a little bit later here in the show. Uh, speaking of Vol of Vol, our old friend the Viking as well, also hitting new lows uh, down to 108. That's down eight points from where it was this time last show. And again, a new all-time low. The previous low was last week's level, which is right around, I do believe, 120, 116. And then we had, the, prior to that, the low for the year was 128. So we have come down quite a bit in both V spikes and V VIX out there. So vol of vol, looking pretty anemic. All right, with the table set, let's go out to the Myax hot seat. Uh, Mr. Matt, a lot going on out there. The markets are red. The vol is mostly red, at least from looking on last week's, last show's perspective, I should say. And vol of vol looking pretty anemic. So a lot of things to sink your teeth into. So what is lighting up your tape this week? Well, a lot of things, Mark. Um, you know, since actually seeing you in person in Chicago in early May, I've been on the road <clears throat> quite a bit. I kind of feel like uh, Johnny Cash a bit. I've been everywhere. Uh, I've been to London, Geneva, Zurich, Vienna, Barcelona, Frankfurt, and Las Vegas and uh, all vol hot spots. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was attending in Europe. I was attending uh, EQ derivatives conference and uh, in Barcelona and the U S version in Las Vegas. And then those other cities were like meetings with customers, all institutional volatility managers. And, you know, in my travels, I heard three consistent themes that I'd, I'd like to share with you. Um, the first consistent theme was there seems to be a bit of surprise or confusion that vol is relatively muted given the strength of the bear market this year. Um, so if you think about SPY is off about 20% peak to trough, about 13% for the year, yet the high for spikes is just 36 spot 48. Now that's that's high, but not massively high in the context of like a March 2020 when spikes got up to 83 and when or Feb 2018 when spikes got up to 43. And, and the real explanation for the relatively muted reaction of vol in the face of a pretty strong bear market is the nature of the sell off itself. So um, 
it's been a very orderly uh, type of sell-off. Uh, it hasn't really been like a shock to the system like uh, 2020 was or 2018. And that's that's why you have a, a relatively muted reaction to vol. It's all driven by uh, the Fed and interest rates, and, and that's an unwind that's going to take a little while to, to complete. So I think we're going to have sustained volatility for a decent amount of time, which brings me to my, my second point uh, that I heard a lot on the road was the death of the 60-40 portfolio. So if you think about the 60-40 portfolio, typically that bond portion is supposed to provide you with some relief uh, when the equity market falls off. Not so this year. Bonds are getting crushed right along with equities. Um, and not only that, in a rising interest rate environment, I heard a lot of talk about potential for corporate bond defaults, that a lot of these high yield companies are going to have to refinance uh, in a higher rate environment and the potential for defaults is higher. That's another uh, thing that's going to sustain volatility higher in the, in, in the, in the coming months. And then the, the last common theme that I heard was this notion that spikes or VIX has to print above 50 before a bottom could be. Uh, be, could be uh, yes, that was our poll question from last week. Yes. Do we need a spike to signal capitulation? What, what did you hear on that end? Well, yeah, a lot of, a lot of people are talking about that. And, and um, quite frankly, my, my reaction to it was uh, – one, I don't, I don't know that we should really use spikes or VIX as a indicator of a bottom or a top. I think that um, it, 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 at the very least, we shouldn't use it in isolation. Uh, calling a, a bottom is 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 like catching uh, a falling knife, right? What, what I, and, and the reason I, I don't really like it is because it, I think it kind of gets away from the essence of what spikes is or what VIX is and and what the spikes index really is. It's just a statistical measure. It's a it's a measure of a 30-day implied volatility based on options prices. And what it's really commuting communicating to us is, you know, the expected range of the market over the next 30 days or so. So we're at, we're at spikes at 25 today. You know, that implies over the next um, 30 days a range of uh, you know, with with spy at 412, you know. 441 or so on the upside, 383 on the downside. And that's really what, what it's communicating. Um, so I don't really like thinking about it in terms of a, a top or a bottom. I, I, I do get the notion of, you know, a flush out, one more flush out before the, before, um, the bottom's in. But I, I think, you know, given all the signals of sustained volatility uh, for the long term, I think we should really be thinking about spikes and VIX in terms of uh, downside management. And and it's great that we've got these derivatives to to help us manage the downside, um, but those were really the, like the, the the three main themes I heard. Generally, muted vol, death of the uh, sixty forty, and and talking about spikes uh, or VIX as a, a signal of the bottom. So it was a a good long trip, uh, but I'm, I'm I'm happy to be home now. <laughs> Let me ask you this, Matt, because we had, like I said, Russell Rhodes on earlier this week. He was also at the EQD events in Barcelona and in Las Vegas. And he said he looks at those, and I kind of see the analogy there, kind of become the, in the light of uh, SIBO not really doing RMC. I'm hearing they're not going to do RMC anymore. They're kind of taking over some of that on the kind of institutional vol side. I mean, we used to go to RMC. It used to be pretty much a couple of presentations. You could lump them into two buckets. One was it seemed like everyone overnight had reawakened to the majesty of selling puts. So we saw a ton of papers on basic things like, oh, uh, I'm selling 5% out of the money S&P puts and look how great it is. And then <laughs> we also used to see a lot of comparison and contrasting between, let's say, some sort of vol upside like a VIX call versus an S&P put. And it seemed you could lump the lion's share of the presentations and the discussions into those two buckets. But Russell was saying he didn't see that this year. In fact, what surprised him was the complete diversity. It seemed like everyone up there had a different strategy or a different approach or a different take on what was going on in the market, which kind of surprised him. I'm curious for you, Matt, did you see something similar? Was there kind of a complete diversity of opinion of what's going on out there and what to do about it? Um, 
Yeah, I, you know, I, I saw Russell in, in both places, spent a decent amount of time with him in, in both places. And uh, well, I'm sorry, good. sir. I, I can't. I have to apologize for that. <laughs> well, I always enjoy spending some time with him. Um, I, I think it, it, there was some diversity, but the diversity generally, I think, surrounded around long, long vol strategies. So the, there, there was I, I think there was a general uh persistent bearishness amongst the crowd and discussing various long volatility strategies that can be employed. Now, a lot of folks were talking their own book, admittedly, and there's you know, long vol fund managers that are looking to collect assets. <laughs> I'm to, guessing Chris Cole from Artemis was there talking up the majesty of long vol. I'm just guessing. <laughs> you you are correct. And if you have ever, ever heard Chris Cole, you'll know that he's... Uh, you know, you, after you after you hear him talk, it feels like you know the world's about to end imminently. When, every time he talks, <laughs> exactly yes, and that was certainly the case. Uh, uh, it was just last week in in Las Vegas that I, I heard him speak. That it seemed like the end of the world was upon us uh, imminently. Um, nevertheless, uh, so I, I, I think you have to take some of those. Uh, Comments with, with a little bit of a grain of salt because the, the the given the perspective at which people are making those comments, nevertheless there there was a pretty pretty broad bearish sentiment um, going on, and uh, I'd say most of the discussion was was from the the long vol um, side of the equation. Interesting, interesting. I do like Chris. He's been on the show in the past, but that man will will aggressively talk up his book like no other. <laughs> Let's go out to another guy who likes to talk up his book once or twice, uh, or usually he likes to fade it on the crystal ball. He is the greasiest of meatballs. Mr. Mark, sir, a lot to unpack in this week of kind of backer and forth, yin and yang type of vol. What was lighting up your tape, sir? Yeah, you know, um, to Matt's point, the the lack of vol with the selling that we've seen, I think, is eyebrow raising. Here we are. We're down 60, and the VIX is barely off the map. Uh, they continue to... Just kind of say, you know what, this is going to be a slow, orderly sell-off. Uh, really, the vol is going to happen on the rallies, not on the sell-offs. And so uh, you better be ready for some face rippers because we're going we're gonna to rip the market higher when we feel like it. And uh, in between that, look for a potential, a potential nice pop in, uh, in uh, you know, a potential anemic VIX while... Vol futures really don't do anything. I mean, if you try to do traditional vol hedging in this market, you got crushed. You got crushed. Long market, long VIX didn't work. Long market, long bonds didn't work. Uh, the only thing that actually worked at all is puts. That was it. You tried to hedge with spikes or VIX, you got your lunch handed to you. You tried to hedge with just about anything other than just owning puts and sitting on them. Uh, you ate a big, giant turd sandwich. Use your technical terms, sir. Yes, <laughs> but you're right. It did not. It did not fare very well. So yeah, even sixty forty, I could argue, has probably been dead for a while. But even let's say the more advanced, modern, updated version of that, which is some sort of what Mark was just saying, kind of long ball, long market, that didn't really, that didn't really have your back recently either we've said it before we'll say it again right at the end of the day the only contractually guaranteed inverse correlation out there is a put so bear that in mind in markets like this let's head on out to the land of the vol futures and mr matt i know when you're not busy talking to me and out there doing the road show for my ex you spend your days looking over and building up the futures over there in spikes land what's the latest and greatest in the world of spikes futures sir yeah, Spikes Futures off to a great start in June. Um, on Wednesday, we traded 7,500 contracts. That was our highest volume day since January 21st. And uh, on that day, the front month futures uh, for Spikes represented about 5% of VIX front month futures. And our, our second month futures represented about 7% of the corresponding uh July VIX futures. So that's a pretty significant inroads into the incumbent product. So we're pretty proud of that. And um, to put that, you know, 7,500 contract day in context, our our ADV uh, in May was 2,000 contracts per day. So it was a really good day. 
June's off to a great start. And um, you know, I think the prospects for growth are, are pretty strong. You know, as I said, I was out on the road and the feedback that I got from the institutional vol community was pretty strong. They're, you know, recognize that Spike's Futures has been demonstrating really strong market quality for several months in both low volatility and high volatility markets. So there's confidence that's being gained by the institutional vol community about the uh, strength of our liquidity and the fact that our liquidity has been there for a long time. So um, many of them have indicated that they're going to adopt spikes into their strategies. So uh, expect these volume numbers to continue to grow. And I, in addition to running into you in Chicago, I also bumped into uh, the Spikes father himself, Mr. Simon Ho, not once, but twice, once here in Chicago and once again a few days later down in Texas. After not having seen him in person for a couple of years, <laughs> saw him twice in a couple of days, he seemed very optimistic, Matt, that we're going to see what is the traditional third pillar for any sort of really derivatives product? You have the futures, you have the options, and then eventually you need the ETFs to come along to drive a little bit of paper. He seemed pretty optimistic that we're going to be seeing the ETFs coming along sooner rather than later. Do you share his optimism, Matt? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I do share his optimism. We're, the Convexity shares uh, is very close to launching uh, two spikes-based ETFs. Um, one would be ticker SPKX, that would be a 1X long. The other would be ticker SPKY, that would be one and a half times long. Um, very close to, to launching. Uh, Convexity Shares does not have a firm launch date yet, but I would be hopeful that, uh, you know, we will know a firm launch date shortly in the next uh, week or two or so. Oh, that's soon. Great. That will certainly be something uh, something new and fun to add to the rundown here on Volatility Views. We love more vol products at the end of the day. Let's head on out to the land of VIX Futures, Mr. Meatball. And we're seeing mostly downside on that front portion of the VIX curve, as you might expect. Not a ton, but certainly certainly uh, measurable out there. The June future coming into showtime was down a little over a point, about 1.2 points from where it was this time last week and July future down about two thirds of a point. So that front portion of that curve continuing to contract a little bit. Mr. Meatball, is there anything catching your eye out there in the land of the volatility futures this week? Yeah, we are back in a contango in the market and uh, both spikes and VIX. Uh, the, you know, the futures curve is pointing toward, you know, some the potential for vol to really really pull back. Uh, and, you know, if if today fails and, and they're not really able to push things lower, uh, you know, the idea that we could get to uh, uh, spikes or VIX in, 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 at 20 or lower is not wildly out of the cards. I got to be honest. Uh, Mark, we cannot get there because I have a 22 puts in my back pocket. So the market oh, gods man. will not allow. We will not bounce hard. We will bounce hard Good off toast. that level. So, yeah, that's pretty much if you want any sort of assurance that we will not get there, that is it for you. Talking about the options now got the spikes land first. Still seeing pretty much similar paper, similar size OI for what we saw this time last week. Again, as Matt alluded to, kind of waiting for that third pillar to kick off, which are the futures, which, as we've seen with VIX and just about every other product out there, really are the thing that can drive a lot of paper at the end of the day. So we're still seeing similar OI out there in spikes options right now to what we saw last week. Still seeing the June 70s and July pars still dominating the tape out there in spikes land. Love to see those those fun strikes out there. Let's see if we can see something similar in the land of VIX options. Spoiler alert, I think we can. Coming into this segment, we're not seeing a ton of paper on the tape. It's not nothing either. It's kind of middle of the road, right around 279,000 contracts. So a little bit shy of halfway to their ADB mark. That ADB has ticked up ever so slightly since this time last week. It's up to 583,000 contracts right now. It's up 8,000 from this time last week. So you can tell right there. It's been a steady week, but nothing blowing the doors off. Let's go out to the top 10 size positions out there in VIX options right now. Last week, it was a pick a coin flip, 50-50 calls versus puts in the top 10. This week, we have swung back in the favor of the puts only slightly, 60-40. Puts over calls out there. Number 10 only cost you 134,000 contracts to break into the top 10 in VIX land right now. That gets you to the June 26 puts. Number nine, 137,000 of our first of four calls 
on the top 10 there, the June 35s, number eight, a buck 46 of the July 20 puts. Number seven, back to the calls, a buck 54 of the August 75. So back to some of those fun strikes there. Number six, 164,000 of the June 30s. And then we have a whole bunch of puts. Nice little put strip here. Number five, buck 66 of the June 22 puts. Number four, buck 78 of the June 23 puts. Number three, a buck 95 of the June 25 puts. Number two, 219,000 of the June 24 puts. And holding down the top spot yet again, in fact, with greater gusto this week, he's added about 100,000. Yep, it's the Ox 75s. Remember, they were hanging out at about a quarter million OI for pretty much a month straight. They added about 100,000. Pretty much we are talking about it on our last show, actually. They're up to 350,000 contracts out there. Mark, we'll get to this week's paper in a second, but I'm curious for you. What are your thoughts on our one by five friend putting on another 100K on the 75 strike in October, sir? They've built a pretty strong position. They're long in July. They're long in August. They're long in September uh, and uh, massively long in October. So they are uh, they're hedging a book. So it doesn't necessarily mean we're we're due for a tanking, but they are they continue to be worried about vol exploding higher. So, you know, that's just something to keep in your back pocket that, you know, a pretty big player thinks vol could blow. Kind of interesting. Interesting indeed. Also interesting that they are so heavy in uh, the October cycle versus all of the others. Past his prologue, they don't call it Rocktober for nothing. So maybe that's why they're loading up in the October cycle. But intriguing stuff there. Let's get out to this week's paper, see if anything else kind of catching our eye. Today, like you said, not the busiest of days, right around 280,000 contracts on the tape. The busiest, most active contract today, the June 23 puts of 23, excuse me, 29,000 contracts, followed by 21,000 of the June 24 puts. 20,000 of the June 42 halves. That's an interesting strike. Don't see that one lighting it up too often. Number four, 15,000 of the June 26 puts. And number five, 11,000 of the June 25 puts. So it's pretty much all puts with one funky call in there. Yesterday, a little bit more paper on the tape. 428,000 contracts. The big trade yesterday, 55,000 of the June 30s, followed by 34,000 of the June 26 calls and 32,000 of the June 25. So three of our top five yesterday in the call side. That's interesting. Number, and then we go down to number four, 17,000 of the June 24 puts and rounding out yesterday, 16,000 of the June 25 puts Wednesday, similar paper, 420,000 contracts on the tape. The big dog on Wednesday, 57,000 of the June 24 puts followed by 54,000 going out to September. Now, not quite as optimistic as the 75s, only to the sixties, 54,000 of the seven sixties on the tape on Wednesday, followed by, then we drop off a cliff to number three, only 13,000 of the June 25 puts, 12,000 of the July 20 puts, and 11,000 of the June 27 puts. Tuesday was, so far at least, the most active day of the week. Again, we were closed for the Memorial Day on Monday, listeners. 528,000 contracts on the tape on Monday. So again, pretty much shy of the ADV almost every day this week. We'll see what today holds in store for us. 528 on the tape on Tuesday. The big dog on Tuesday, the June 25 puts trading 62,000 contracts. Nothing to sneeze at. Then we fall off to number two, 25,000 of the July 29 calls. Number three, 20K of the June 50s. Number four, 20,000 as well of the July 60s. And rounding out the top five on Monday, 19,000 of the June 23 puts. Mr. Meatball, we talked about our one five friend. Anything else? Catching your eye out there in a fairly light week, all things considered, on the VIX options front. Yeah, you know, um, earlier in the week, there was a pretty heavy buyer the 24 puts. Uh, they, they bought a lot of them throughout the day in small blocks. Uh, if you look at VIX, they built a pretty big position uh, on June downside. So they've, they've got the, uh, a pretty decent amount of those VIX 24 puts open. I think those are over 200,000 uh, in open interest. So there's some some pretty heavy speculating that we could see the other side of 24 uh, potentially in the next, you know, in the next couple of days. They're down to only 50 cents. That's not a bad little purchase. I don't I don't hate that idea. Yep, we got push and pull there. We got the June 24, so number two, 219,000 contracts open versus the Ox 75s, 350. Which one will we hit first? <laughs> Let us know. Get out there. Yeah, maybe maybe 50 cents. Maybe that's uh, up your alley. Again, we're going to bounce off 22. We've already established that. But we can get to 24. Let's see what we've got going on out here 
in the land of inverse volatility. Our old friend Svix coming into showtime was at a little bit north of the 11 handle, about 11 tenths, up about half a point. As the show has progressed, it's up to about 11.40. So that puts it up nearly a full point on the week. Again, SVIX, of course, listeners. The inverse of VIX, so as VIX erodes, SVIX tends to go up. <laughs> and if you're wondering, is there a lot of options paper going up in SVIX today? The answer is a resounding no. There's 85 contracts on the tape today. Man, that is a whole heck of a lot of nothing. Uh, the ADV has ticked up a little bit. It's almost 700 contracts right now, 696. But as we speculated in the past, SVIX not exactly blowing the doors off yet from an options perspective. Underlying a little bit of a different story, but we like to look at the options here and not so much on the options front. Let's just do a quick top three because, again, not a lot of paper trading out here. The biggest position open right now in SVIX are the June 13 calls, about 458 of those, followed by number two, the June 11s. 343 and number three, the June 12 call. So all calls, which is interesting, probably what you would expect out there for SVIX. But again, not a ton of paper. Uh, Mark, does this surprise you that SVIX is doing a whole lot of nothing today and anything catching your eye out there this week? No, I'm not surprised. The The option volume has never picked up, but I'm the stock volume has been good. They've been doing over a million shares a day. Uh, UVIX absolutely doing a ton of volume. Uh, I've seen some days where that's been three, four, five mil, uh, you know, almost pro- starting to threaten five million. So, uh, like I said, I, I think there's some some potential real uh, upside on on these ETFs. Let's go out to your friend UVIX, see if that one can follow suit. That is the levered VIX product, the 2X VIX product out there, listeners. And, you know. The ADV would would support that, Mr. Meatball. The ADV is up to 2,515. It seems like it grows by about 500 contracts pretty much every week, and that is the case again. This week was right around 2,000. Last week, up to 2,500. So slowly but surely, we are seeing UVIX climb the ranks out there. When we kicked off the show, UVIX was at 17 and a quarter, so down two points from where it was this time last week, it has since given up another point and a quarter. So it's down three and a quarter to about 16 right now. So that has continued to give up the ghost out there. Let's see if the options are following suit this week, if we're getting any love on these. And, you know, it's kind of an anemic day across the board on the options front. Uh, UVIX also not doing a ton of options paper today. I said it's the ADV has just crossed 2,500. Doesn't seem like it's going to hit it today. <laughs> no joy today. 780 contracts only on the tape. So it does not seem like we're going to get there today. Let's do some quick breakdown top three out here because there are some actually decently sized positions here in UVIX. The top position right now, the July 19s, 3,400 of those, followed by number two, the July 27s, 2,250 of those, and number three, 2,000 exactly of the D's 18 puts. That's interesting. That's one of the first longer term. If you actually go to four, number four there, we have the Jan 15 puts, a thousand of those as well. So there are some longer term put positions out here, which is kind of interesting. We haven't seen, and usually a lot of these bot products, we see a lot of longer term positioning coming in, particularly in your VXXs and your UVXYs. Haven't really seen as much yet in UVX, but it seems like that stuff starting to percolate through Mr. Meatball, I think catching your eye out there in the land of the 2X levered UVIX this week, sir. Uh, yeah, like I said, the volume may be a little lighter today, but this thing has definitely been trading, uh, definitely moving. Not the, the options have not tightened up enough yet for me to really be interested in the options, but um, the uh, movement in the actual ETF, pretty darn good. Uh, I believe I, I believe you threw out the, the ADV, really Pick it, pick it up pretty nice. It's doing, uh, I mean, it's already over a million shares today. Uh, the average volume is one point, almost 1.4. So I'll think, I think it's going to do 2 million today, uh, maybe one and a half million. So this, this is the, you would definitely call this one a success. Certainly seems for all the headline grabbing that SVIX did, it does seem like the lion's share of the interest heading over to UVIX. Is that the case for you folks as well? Do you prefer UVIX? Are you trading UVIX more? Underlying our options will be open. We'll, we'll take both versus SVIX. Hit us up. Let us know. We want to hear from you folks. Getting on out to a product that used to be 
Big Dog, King of the Roost. There were days when this was doing more paper than VIX itself from an options perspective. Those were the tail wagging the dog days. These days, far cry from that. Of course, I'm talking about the ever broken, ever controversial VXX. 22 and a half when we kicked off the show down a little over two and a half points, about 2.7 points from where it was this time last week. Again, today, looking kind of anemic, only 76,000 contracts on the tape. Uh, that ADV is also plunged down to 111,000. It's down another 9,000 from where it was this time last week. I can't remember the last week it really increased with any sort of gusto out there. It seems like folks have just kind of washed their hands of VXX. And who can blame them? This this product, I think, is charitably can be described as broken. When the issuer kind of washes his hands of it and says, you know, we're, we're not really supporting it. It, it, all kinds of issues with it, that tends to spook folks. So. I guess until they hear more clarity from Barclays, they're gonna we're gonna be down in these levels for a while. So yeah, VXX continuing to uh, suffer. Let's look really quickly and see if anything is lighting it up. Let's just do a quick top five out here. Number five in VXX right now, forty thousand of the July eighteen puts, followed by number four, forty one thousand of the July nineteen puts. Number three, forty three thousand of the July twenty puts. You get the theme here, listeners. Number two, forty seven thousand of the June sixteen puts, and number one, hundred nine thousand of the AUG. 16 puts out there looking at the top trades today. We've got the big dog today, They're all expiring today, pretty much the June 22 half puts and the 23 puts makes sense. That's pretty much where we're hanging out about 5,500 of each of those. So not of a heck of a lot to report as expected. I think until we get more clarity on this, this is kind of going to be the case. VXX is going to be treading water or eroding. Mr. Meatball, I know you still have a little bit of downside out there. It seems like the rest of the world is aligned with you. It's been nothing but puts pretty much for the better part of the last month out there in the VXX OI. Anything catching your eye in the land of VXX this week, sir? Not really. Um, yeah, you're seeing some put volume here. Uh, biggest trade of the day, you got some, uh, you got a July, uh, a July, a, a June 19 and a half put buyer. You've got a July 19 put buyer. You've got some, you know, a few things here or there, but mostly just, uh, you know, cheap out of the money puts being bought, waiting for this thing to potentially normalize. Uh, it is definitely getting a squeeze today, though. I'll tell you that. I mean, it has no business being up 85 cents when UBXY is up 50. Uh, it's actually up a greater percent than UBXY. That's one of the problems with doing anything but spreading off downside here that this thing can absolutely pop when, um, you know, when we do get a rally because it is like a zombie, right? It just kind of does what it wants. Ah, uh, the zombie that is VXX. If you guys washed your hands of it, it seems like most people have given these volume numbers, but hit us up. Let us know if you have alternate theories on the subject. Let's go out to UBXY. We used to joke about it, kind of call it the last of the Mohegans. It is now only one of a growing and more crowded vol space. <laughs> and with what Matt was just saying, some spikes ETPs on the horizon. It's going to get a little bit more interesting out there in the vol ETP landscape pretty soon. So UVXY may be kind of struggling to find its place now in this new vol landscape. Uh, coming into showtime, 1440, down a little over a point, about 1.3 points from where it was this time last week. We're seeing it pretty much tread water on the vol side as well, the ADB. Is 303. That's down about 4,000 this time last week. So, really, nothing to write home about in terms of volume from an ADV perspective. Uh, today, it looks like they're going to hit that 216,000 contracts on the tape today. Before we get to what's lighting it up out there today, let's get out to, let's do a quick top five in UBXY land. Number five, 15,000 of the June 10 puts. Number four, 15,000 as well of the June 13 puts. Those are expiring today on the third. Number three, 18, almost 19,000 of the June 75. So it's more of that funky upside sneaking its way in there. Number two, 26,000 of the June 11 puts. And rounding out the top five in UBXY this week, June 12 puts, 31, almost 32,000 of those bad boys. So that seems like pretty much par for the course. All downside with the exception of a handful of crazy upside. That sounds like UBXY to me. In terms of today's paper, the big dog today, as you might expect, it's pretty much all expiring today on the 3rd, 17,000 of the June 14th, 14,000 of the June 13 halves, and 13,000 of the June 13 half puts. Mr. Meatball, are you still playing out there in UBXY or have some of these new vol darlings started to steal your attention? 
Well, for options, UVXY is the way to go because UVX is still too wide. Um, and so, yeah, I have been playing it and, uh, you know, I've been kind of the, along with VVIX being low, these vol ETPs are also at multi-year lows as they should be. And, uh, there's been some pretty good opportunity to, uh, some, uh, to put some dollars at work and, 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 uh, make some money playing this thing both ways. You haven't been making money trading it both ways out there in earnings vol, at least from a net season on season perspective. You can check out these reports for yourselves over there, theoptionsinsider.com. Click on the options news and articles tab, listeners, to begin your journey to the dark side of earnings volatility. Still some names reporting, even though we are coming on the tail end of the season. This week we saw Salesforce and HP on Tuesday, GameStop and Chewy on Wednesday, yesterday. Hormel, Sienna, Lands End, Duluth Trading, Lululemon. They have the sheer yoga pants infamy. And Samsung, we have reports hot off the presses, my friends, over there at Orats for all of those and a whole bunch more. We'll just do a handful here. Chewy popping off actually on the first, so Wednesday night after the bell. 23.5 is where they were trading. They were pricing in 16.3%. They ended up delivering 19.1%. So interesting stuff afoot there a little bit of outperformance out there on chewy land and they're actually higher right now they're almost 29 28 81 even though they are giving up about a third of a point right now so again your performance is going to vary depending on your frame of reference these reports are just looking at the immediate post earnings of all annihilation and the movement that results and how they compare to each other and if you of course hold it to the end of the week you're gonna have a very different frame of reference duluth trading let's see what happened out there they were the second before the bell they were trading 1266. They were pricing in 9.3% listeners. And get this, they delivered 0.9%. So <laughs> they were pretty much unched on their announcement. Of course, again, same deal. If you had a short premium, you had a short time to and a short window to close it out because they are now trading 11 and a quarter. So they have moved quite a bit. But in the interim, that looked like one of the better premium sales we've seen in quite some time. Interesting. Looks like they also shot up on the rally yesterday to nearly 14s. They've done a lot of living since their earnings announcement. <laughs> let's look really quickly at some names we have popping off. We had uh, Lulu. We have, uh, let's play, let's go up five below. They're next week after the bell on the 8th. Uh, Neo on the 9th. We'll get to more of that, I believe, on good old option block probably on Monday. Let's get out to the season and looking at how things are stacking up. The seasons going back for the last three years are pretty much Past the start of the pandemic, we have seen the seasons averaging out at about 88%. That means, listeners, if you bought a basket of all the straddles out there, you lost money. <laughs> you only made back about 88 cents on the dollar. Well, this season is looking even lighter than that. We're hanging out right now at 83%. A week one was 64%. That was the worst week by far of the, se of the season. Week two, 70%. Week three, 98%. Almost got there. Not quite. Number four. 82%, week five, 87%, and week six, 81%. All of that averaging out to about 83%. So yet again, if you bought Val, not looking good, at least in aggregate. Obviously, single names can outperform. Just look at Netflix. Look at Snap. There are names that can outperform from a Vol perspective. But in aggregate, you lost money. Let's go on out to also the earnings trades reports. If you're wondering, what can I do with this information? How can I use it? How can I process and maybe trade earnings Vol? Well, our friends over there at Orats are crunching all those numbers for you as well. They're tracking four different types of trades, long straddles, short straddles, long calendars, and strangely enough, short calendars. Not a trade most of you should probably be doing, but an intriguing one nonetheless. They currently are tracking 90 long calendars, or 90 long straddles, 40 short straddles, and 95 long calendars. No short calendars, thankfully. They put on some new ones in Duluth and some other names this week. Again, you can see that report, the season report, the results and the move reports all for free. Theoptionsinsider.com is the place to go to learn more. Meanwhile, we have to get on into your segment. It is time to check the volatility voicemail. It's time to share your thoughts and opinions with your fellow volatility traders. It's time to check the volatility voicemail. Make your voice heard by dialing 779-669-4VOL. 
posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com, sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com, or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options or facebook.com slash the options insider. All right, everybody, welcome to the Volatility Voicemail, the portion of the show where you folks ask questions. We also turn the spotlight back on you on occasion, ask you guys some questions. Like we did this week, we mentioned our question of the week, and this week I'll pay that off in a second. First, let's pay off last week's question because it dovetails with exactly what Matt was talking about from all the conversations going on at all these international vol conferences. Quite simply, do we need a big spike pun intended, in VIX or spikes to signal a blow-off in these markets. Uh, we asked you that last week. We said many of you are waiting for a vol spike before you dive back into these markets. What level does VIX have to hit to signal concession in the broad markets? Gave you four choices. North of 50, north, excuse me, north of 40, north of 50, north of 60, and north of 70. This has sparked a lot of back-and-forth conversation on vol Twitter as people speculated and gave their theory. Some folks said you don't need that at all. Other folks said you do in different levels. It was very fascinating to see how different people view this subject. Mark, I remember your compatriot who joined us on the Vol View stage a couple of weeks ago live here in Chicago. He wants to see a retracement all the way back to those 80 levels, the dark days of the pandemic. So very much a diversity of opinion on this issue. They ended up north of 40, eking it out with 42.8%, followed by number two, north of 50 24.1%, then north of 70, jumping up 21.7% for that one, and then north of 60, 11.4%. So intriguing stuff out there. And then this week's question, we're asking you right now, again, VVIX back below 100 for the first time in over a year. V spikes also at pretty much all-time lows. Is this the start of a new vol regime or just the calm before the storm? Gave you three choices Start of a new vol regime, the calm before the storm, or you find vol of vol confusing. Uh, Mr. Matt, we will start with you. First off, what are your thoughts on our poll from last week about our audience saying we do need a slight spike in vol and their suggestion north of 40 to signal the end, the blow off in this market? What are your thoughts on that? And then B, what are, you, what are your thoughts on this week's question? Is this new era of lower vol of vol? Is this here to stay? Is this the start of a new regime? Or just the calm before the storm, sir? Well, in terms of last week's question, I think it's pretty interesting how I don't, how often I heard about that uh, being spoke about while I was on the road. Um, so clearly that is resonating amongst the, that question was, you know, percolating and resonating and getting out there. You know why, Matt? They all saw our poll question. So it engendered discussion internationally. I think it, I think it did. Um, but yeah, I, I think that, uh, the, you know, notion of it, of getting above 40 or above 50, I do think you're going to, there, there, there certainly more volatility ahead of us. The, the, the lows probably are not in and we're probably going to see some higher vol levels. So I, th- I, I agree with the sentiment there. Um, in terms of, uh, this week's question, uh, I would answer it as, you know, this is the start of a new vol regime in the sense that, you know, lower vol of vol really is indicating to us that um, the market has become accustomed to, you know, VIX and spikes at a 25, 30 level, and that the market is, you know, finding comfort and in, in normalcy at that level. Um, so I would say start it's the start of a new vol regime, but I uh, sympathize with the answer of vol of vol is confusing. And I'm going to try to say something that makes it less confusing, uh, or at least try to. So when you think of vol of vol, you have a couple of different metrics out there. You've got VVIX and you've got V spikes. So, but they use different methodologies to calculate vol of vol as opposed to like uh, VIX and spikes, which use the same methodologies, Met- that methodology being a, uh, a standard variance swap methodology, where you look at upside calls and you, on, on options and you look at downside puts. Now, in a standard variance swap methodology, the downside, the puts are weighted more than the upside, and that's appropriate on an equity index. It's appropriate on, a, uh, on an equity um, because the risk is to the downside. 
Now, a, vol a measure of vol of vol, the risk is not to the downside, the risk is to the upside. So the question is, should a standard variance swap methodology be applied to a volatility index? And at my X, we feel that no, that should not be the case, that a simple variance methodology where there's equal weighting to the upside of the calls and the equal weighting to the downside of the puts. And that's why you get different numbers of VVIX and V-spike. So VVIX currently at you know 91-ish, V-spikes at you know 111-ish. So that's why you're getting a different uh, measure of volatile. And we think that the way that we're measuring it via the simple variance methodology, accounting for the risk being to the upside, is a more appropriate uh, way to measure ball of ball. I like it. Mr. Meatball, any thoughts first off on the results of our poll? Kind of taking the opposite of your friend Chris there. They're not saying we need to blow up north of 80 in, in Bix and Spikes. Just around 40 will do. So your thoughts on that. And then for this week, your thoughts on this period we're in now below par out there in VVIX and similar levels out there in V-Spikes. Is this the start of a new ball regime or just the calm before the storm, sir? You know, I, I don't know. It feels like if, when you look at all, you know, we were, we talked a little bit at the top of the show about bonds. And I don't know if you've noticed the paper going up in HYG, but it is alarming. There is, and in JNK, for that matter, um, there is just massive, and I mean massive, put hedging in HYG going up almost on a daily basis. And so... Um, you know, do I think we need to get to 80? No. Do I think that we could see 40 before this is all said and done? If we start running into some credit problems, uh, when the, if the bond market starts starts feeling it, uh, and we're now in a spot where the Federal Reserve is starting to, to uh, unload their book, then we could absolutely see the VIX get to 40 and uh, another test of down 20%, and then who knows from there. All right, well, let's see what we've got here. I told you the results for last week's. Right now, our question of the week is running 75.6% uh, of you saying this is just the calm before the storm. So maybe they're seeing all that HYG put action you're talking about out there, Mr. Meatball. But they're a little spooked, probably understandably, given all the uh, unknown unknowns lurking out there. 15.6% of you, so a very small percentage, say this is the start of a new presumably lower vol and indeed vol of vol regime and almost nine percent saying vol of vol is confusing maybe matt's maybe matt's definition helped clear that up for you a little bit before we get into the crystal ball really quickly mr meatball uh, you missed this on the option block yesterday i would be remiss if i did not get your thoughts on this poll question as well we ended up having as we are wont to do on that show a contentious heated debate sparked by our pro members in our live chat they were debating during the show uh, the merits of various sequels. I think because we were the Top Gun sequel just came out. And what is the greatest sequel of all time? So we ended up putting that out into a little flash poll for our audience. We gave them three choices. What is the, your favorite movie sequel? Empire Strikes Back, Terminator 2, Godfather Part 2, or Other. We had a bunch of write-ins for this Maverick. People are liking that. Maybe some recency bias there. I think we had some Toy Story 2 and a few others. But Mr. Meatball, the end results were a tie. A third each for Empire and Terminator 2, 19% for Godfather Part 2, only 14% for others. So what do you think of those results? And what is your favorite movie sequel? You know, that's a tough question because Godfather, the best movie is obviously Godfather 2. But that doesn't make it the best sequel. And, you know, when you look at how bad Terminator 1 is and then how amazing Terminator 2 is, uh, it, it's hard to argue with that. And then what was the other one that tied it? It was also a great sequel. Empire. Empire is like the standard answer everybody gets, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the only one that the only one of the original three that George Lucas didn't direct exactly. and is awesome. Exactly. Yes. Didn't write, didn't direct. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah, that is that is probably the second best movie. Um, I liked the the first movie, though. And, you know, it, 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 well, it's not light years ahead of the first movie. It's much better than the, the Jedi, than uh, Return of the Jedi. I'm sorry, but I, you know... My two sons love the Ewoks. I, I just don't. <laughs> it, I just can't. I can't deal with the Ewoks. Um, but, you know, I, I'm going to say that I, I got to go with uh, with Terminator 2 as, you know, when, it, when you look at the spread between the two, 
um, Terminator 2 is the greatest spread. And wow. so that, that would be my... I did not expect you to go with that. In fact, T2 just came out of our chat. I wasn't even thinking T2. They suggested it. That was a good suggestion. It is a great movie. That's a great I mean, movie. A great so sequel. so much better than Terminator yes. 1. I guess if you look at it solely through the light of the chasm between the first and the second, then you might be right. <laughs> one was a low budget. T1 is like made for like a couple hundred grand, I think. So yeah, very different beasts. I digress. As we keep on rolling, it is time to get difficult. It is time to get dangerous. It is time. For the crystal ball. It's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store. It's time to look into the crystal ball. All right, everybody. Welcome to the crystal ball, the portion of the show. Where we attempt to wrestle with what the vol gods hold in store. And I said earlier in the show, I said, maybe it looks like maybe we are starting a bit of a rally again. We had bounced off that 4,100 handle out in the S&P. Seems like that is reversing again, trending back down towards that 4,100 handle again. So vol giveth and vol taketh away. That means vol getting a little bit squirrelier, a little bit frothier here. Let's see, where were we at the start of the show? We were at a little bit frothier out here in Vault Land. Yeah, Vault VIX Cash was about 25 and a quarter when we kicked off the show. It's right around 2540 right now. Spikes 25 and a half when we kicked off the show, 2566 right now. So a slightly, slightly frothier than where we were at the start of the show. Let's see. This time last week, no one actually, Mr. Meatball, you were 2626. So in spikes. You might have a chance. Where'd my VIX go? There we go. Yeah, you're closer in spikes, obviously. See, so you're within at least 0.6. So you're within a one point. So that's at least something. You're not within our tenth of a point margin of victory, obviously. But I, I will tip my cap to you then. Myself and uh, Joe Tigue from Equity Armor were both at a 29 handle. I was at 29.24. He was at 29.76. So no joy for us. Looks like a lot of our listeners. Oh, yeah. Unlimited was at the 315 million also in our live chat. For a Top Gun opening. I think we all sold that to you. That was, you said domestic. There's no way any movie's making that domestically. Uh, so, yeah, unfortunately, I think you owe us some money there, uh, Mr. <laughs> I think I sold 100 contracts to you. So, one to one with the futures. Uh, so, that means, Mr. Meatball, I think you get the pride of place of going first this week, sir, as being the closest. What are you feeling for Val this time next week, sir? Yeah, you know, maybe that wasn't a bullseye, bullseye, but, it, you know, it was that 20, it definitely hit the, uh, the 25 point ring, I'll, I'll say, you know, pretty close, especially in this market. With Not terrible in this around. environment, sir. I'll give it to you closer than me. But, well, yes, but that's like being the best tallest mountain in Iowa. It's says, not like that. Says the same. man who has never won the crystal ball trophy, yet I have won it almost every year. <laughs> I have it on my desk right now, engraved uh, with my image. Yeah. Uh, I got to tell you, um, you know, I'm sensing higher next week. Um, maybe not a lot, but I think we're going to be a little higher. Uh, we'll probably touch 30 again and then pull back a little, a little bit. So I'm going to say 26, 26. I'm just going to say, if you say 26, 26 again, <laughs> ah, the deep analysis of the meatball, 26, 26 yet again, Mr. Matt, you didn't guess last week. So you did not have a chance to be wrong like the rest of us. So what are you feeling for this time next week, sir? Well, for this time next week, you have to consider that next Friday morning, uh, CPI, um, this market is hyper focused on inflation. Um, I'm, you know, it might be overhang from my travels uh, the, on the bearish sentiment that I've been hearing while I was out there, but I'm uh, kind of joining that bearish sentiment i think that uh we'll, we'll be higher in higher vol levels in a week as a result of uh that cpi number and i think we'll be back above 30 i'm going to call it uh 3125 on spikes 3125 feeling his oats out there as you were speaking i wrote uh, 2853 down so that's what i'm feeling for this time next week out here in the land of the crystal ball that music means we are done for this week but before we go mr matt a i didn't give you a chance to weigh in so if you have a favorite movie sequel to add to our poll list have at it and then b if folks want to learn more about all things going on in the land of my where should they go what should they do 
Yeah, movie sequels, I was kind of surprised that, you know, Anchorman 2 or Hangover 2 didn't make <laughs> Anchorman <the best>. 2. <laughs> Anchorman, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. I, I, I would go with Empire Strikes Back. Uh, I will say the news fights of the Anchorman movies are fantastic. The rest of the movie, <laughs> I don't know. I could just watch those scenes and that'd be, be done. You know, actually, Mark, the day, uh, you know, at a, a certain point I was working for, uh, when I was working at Group One, uh, we had a little differences of opinion. The day that I left Group One, I was also the opening day of Anchorman, and I washed Anchorman and killed off half a bottle of rum in the process. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, not didn't, not a great story. I'm trying to think of other good sequels that are out there. You had a difference of opinion with someone? I find that hard to believe. I know, I know. Believe it or not, they didn't like my jokes. Um, the I'm trying to think of good sequels. I'm kind of excited about um, this is Spinal Tap 2 coming out. I think that is going to be a, a, a monster, and I'm kind of looking forward to that. Oh, when getting... that comes out, all sorts of um, great we suggestions. We call today. Monty Python: Life of Brian a sequel. That was hilarious. There's some good ones out there. I don't know if all the Monty Python movies are considered to be in the Python verse, and aren't they all kind of their own thing? <laughs> but uh, I suppose we can debate that for another day. If folks want to hit you up, Mr. Meatball, to discuss all your various sequel choices in more detail. Where should they go? What should they do? Go to optionpit.com and you can read about uh, VIX, volatility, spikes, the whole nine yards on my VIX Edge blog. Every day we're putting out really great information about how we're trading this market and taking advantage of what's out there. Uh, it's free. Why wouldn't you read it? Go to optionpit.com and read my daily analysis on volatility. I have a listener who went 2644 in our live chat, Mr. Meatball. They're accusing you of snubbing them or kind of just carping them. So there you go. You'll have to deal with our, our pro listeners there. Go to optionpit.com to register your complaint with the Meatball himself. For all of you on the on-demand side, that's going to conclude our broadcast week for you folks. Hope you had a great week tuning in with us. Stay safe. We'll see you back on Monday. For all the rest of you, stay tuned either in the live chat or on the pro podcast feed. We'll be back in a little bit with options oddities and then of course we'll all be back again next friday another episode of volatility views volatility views is brought to you by myax one of the fastest most efficient trading platforms in the world myax is proud to bring you spikes volatility products spikes options and futures are traded on the spikes volatility index spike Offering pinpoint accuracy, radically faster dissemination, and a highly transparent settlement auction. All for ultra-low exchange fees. It's volatility reimagined. Learn more about spikes at myaxoptions.com slash spikes. Options and futures involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. The statements made are provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied on for financial or legal advice. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. <laughs>